Live from our hurricane headquarters with real-time analysis from some of the nation's top meteorologists, this is Tracking the Tropics, powered by Bose Electric. Oh, the 2023 hurricane season officially wrapping up. It has been a long six months to say the least, and it has been an above average season, at least in terms of the numbers. We were impacted, though, by several storms. Welcome into the last edition, official edition of Tracking the Tropics here uh, on this uh, last episode. We could have another storm. It's not out of the question. If so, we would maybe have another Tracking the Tropics. But for now, this is going to be our last episode of the season. So we have to do a wrap up of everything that happened this year so far. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, meteorologist Amanda Holly in the WFLA Now Stream Center, of course, joined by WFLA meteorologist Rebecca Berry. Hi there. It's so nice to be saying that hurricane season's coming to an end. Yes, it very much so. It has been a weird, long season, to say the least. With nothing but questions the yeah. whole time. <laughs> <laughs> questions of what's going to happen next. You know, we've already started to look back a little bit. Every week we uh, talked to a bunch of different featured meteorologists, and we were talking about, you know, what did you think was going to happen, and how do you think the season has wrapped up so far? So it's a, it's been interesting to hear, you know, everyone's different takes on the season so far. But by the numbers... It's been above average, but officially hurricane season ends November 30th, the last day of November. Uh, have we had storms in December before? Yes, typically they are weak. Typically they are fish storms. Uh, it is possible for us to see another name storm or two. Certainly not out of the question. Is it likely? No. But now our focus is really going to become the storms that are coming in, the winter storms, right? The areas of low pressure, the winter uh, snowstorms that come into the Midwest. And because we have El Nino in place, uh, we will be talking a lot about systems that will move through the Gulf of Mexico. There's still areas of low pressure. They just don't have tropical characteristics, even though it'll bring us cloudy conditions, rainy conditions across the southeast, um, and some windy conditions as well. But in terms of the tropics, the official season end date is the last day of November. So how have we uh, wrapped up so far? The recap, we've had 20 tropical systems. That does include one unnamed tropical system in January that the National Hurricane Center went back and looked at some data and said, yeah, that was probably a tropical or subtropical storm, but it doesn't get a name when you look at it after the fact. So officially we have had 19 named storms during the hurricane season. Seven of those were hurricanes and three of those were major hurricanes. And when you look at the forecast numbers next to those, um, those total numbers, yeah, both NOAA and Colorado State University were pretty much right on target with the number of storms, the number of hurricanes, and the number of major hurricanes, which, again, if you think back to the beginning of the season, well, we were having El Nino develop, and typically in an El Nino year, we have fewer storms develop. Uh, so a lot of meteorologists were thinking, well, you know, that's probably a little ambitious, the number of storms there. But we also, at the same time, had record warm Atlantic sea surface temperatures. And the big question at the beginning of the season, really for the first several months of hurricane season, was which one is going to end up winning out. And we do know that, obviously, now the warm waters ended up winning out. Luckily, a lot of the storms ended up being fish storms. We did have Harold, which impacted South Texas there. Arlene formed first, obviously, the A name there um, in the Gulf of Mexico. And it actually meandered south, south through the Gulf. Obviously, we had Idalia. That was kind of the big storm that impacted the United States. You can see those colorful lines as Idalia made its way toward the Florida Panhandle. That's because it was a major hurricane. It was a Category 4 for a long time, um, and it ended up weakening, weakening down to a Category 3 right before landfall. Did make landfall in a, a rather unpopulated area, but saw a lot of storm surge up and down the coast, everywhere from Sarasota northward up through the Big Bend region. So that was a big um a big thing with Idalia was that storm surge and the water damage up along up along the nature coast there, unfortunately. And then it continued on and it impacted Georgia. It impacted impacted South Carolina. And speaking of the Carolinas, they also were impacted by Ophelia. Ophelia formed 
relatively quickly moved off to the north, made landfall within about 48 hours or so. Um, it wasn't a particularly strong storm, but it did form quickly and moved on shore um, in North Carolina there, certainly brought some rain uh, and some storm surge along the coast. Then you had Lee, which was a very long-lived storm. Um, it was our strongest storm of the season. And it ended up kind of riding up along the eastern seaboard. Didn't officially make landfall in the United States, but it was right on the edge. Um, and it did bring a lot of kind of wind and rain up toward the northeast. So those were the most notable storms for the United States. But Rebecca, I mean, look at all of these lines here out in the Atlantic. This is what we like to see in an above average year because... Yeah, we had a lot of numbers, we had a lot of names, but we didn't have to give a lot of those names a lot of attention. Exactly, and this is why when those long-term seasonal forecasts come out, we as scientists love them because it's fascinating to think about all the different factors they're taking into account and the science behind them, but it doesn't tell you where those storms are going to impact. And even if you had only one storm for the entire season, if it hit your backyard, it would be a bad season for right. you. And so this is a perfect example of what's an above average season, but turned out pretty quiet for a lot of people especially areas in South Florida. I know that, you know, I've, I've spoken to a, a few people outside of work and talked about hurricane season. And a lot of people have said, wow, it was, it was an above average year because it didn't seem like we had a lot of activity. And that's great <laughs> because, yes, a lot of those storms uh, were storms that we just didn't, we didn't have to pay, you know, give much time in our weather cast to. <laughs> and we touched on this in the last episode about quantity over quality. A lot of these storms were not incredibly strong. One of the markers that we use for the hurricane season is called accumulated cyclonic energy. So basically it measures the energy that a storm produces, and then it measures the energy an entire season produces. And if you look at the entire season, it's actually average. And if you look at what the average accumulated cyclonic energy each storm produced, it's below average. And so it was just a weird different year. It sure was. Uh, you know, we had we had several strong storms out there for sure. Of course, Lee uh, had that beautiful satellite picture. It strengthened, I mean, I think rapidly is an understatement. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, because it became that Category 5. It was brief, uh, but it came, became a Category 5 so quickly. Took advantage of those warm waters there. Um, luckily, it stayed just off the, uh, the Caribbean islands as it, um, as it passed by, that's when it was at its strongest point. But yeah, 12 fish storms. We will take it, right? But regardless, they add to the numbers, right? So yeah, 2023 certainly ended up being above average. With those 20 storms, 19 name storms, that brought us all the way to the T storm. Uh, Vince and Whitney uh, still left on the list there. Again, we could see Vince and Whitney. It's not out of the question. It would be, um, you know, a, a, a low chance for us to get those. Yes, and if we do, they'd most likely be fish storms based on the patterns this time of the year and the cold fronts that are already starting to roll through. Yeah, and we talked uh, at length last episode about that. The El Nino pattern uh, finally starting to show its, its pattern in the winter. It has a pattern in the summer, and it has a pattern in the winter and how it affects the United States. States uh, weather and we didn't see that pattern a lot over the summer but we are seeing it a good bit now with several storm systems rolling in uh, and, and uh, we'll get to that here in just a second but wanted to talk a little bit about the notable facts of 2023 we mentioned Idalia a little bit here um, obviously we talked a little bit about Lee Harold and Ophelia those were the impactful storms for the United States but Lee was just um, it was a long-lived storm it was a very strong storm there and kind of clipped the very, uh, very corner of the Northeast. Uh, but one notable, notable fact, uh, Rebecca, that I saw on Twitter from Michael Lowry, he posted uh, a beautiful map of the number of hours that each state and each area spent in a National Hurricane Center forecast cone. So he did a lot of data analysis, so I wanted to give him credit for this. Um, but North Carolina actually spent the longest time in a forecast cone with 174 hours, which um, is, you know, North Carolina, yeah, they kind of jut out there. So maybe it's, maybe it's expected, right, mm -hmm. in an unusual year. But the next highest number of hours spent in the forecast cone was Maine. That's wild. Yeah. Really, At 100, really 168 hours. That's that's incredible. Part of it was the fact that the forecast cones were so accurate. Yes. Weekly. 
but also how long Lee was out there. Yes, and it was just aiming right for the northeast. Um, and because it did have such a good forecast track, yeah, it was a little bit longer. So uh, it did. It did. You guys spent quite. Quite some time there and an unusual spot in um, a forecast cone. South Florida, interestingly enough, not a single hour in a forecast cone, which I know South Florida is happy about. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. Um, but they obviously did a couple weeks ago um, have that non-tropical area of low pressure move through. They got some record amounts of rainfall. Uh, it was kind of like a tropical system, felt like it, right? But yeah. the actual characteristics were not tropical. So that's why it didn't have a name. But they were impacted by some sort of area of low pressure this year. <laughs> yeah, they were seeing 70 and 80 mile per hour wind gusts out on the buoys and along the coastline. They felt like they were in a tropical system, whether it was named or not. Yeah, Mother Nature was like, we're not letting you get off that easy. <laughs> And I think one of the things that as scientists will look back on most this season wasn't in the Atlantic. It was in the Pacific with Hurricane Otis's extremely yes. rapid intensification. The people of Acapulco went to bed to a tropical, expecting a tropical storm and woke up to a Cat 5. I mean, it was just, insane. just devastation there. It was um, none of the forecasts. The, the craziest part about that storm wasn't necessarily the rapid intensification. It was just that none of the forecast models showed it. And forecast model intensity is one of the more mercurial elements of hurricane forecasting. And I wonder if the conversation will lead to we need to find a way to fly those storms. Yeah. And in the Pacific. In the Pacific to, to be able to provide more data for the forecast models. Yes. Uh, so they are still uh, recovering there in Acapulco, but definitely an interesting storm that will be studied for years to come and why and what exactly the forecast models missed with that Um with that storm in general but looking back obviously we have our we have our answer now to uh the infamous 2023 hurricane season question the warm waters beat out the el nino <laughs> it beat about heart yeah <laughs> that el nino didn't even seem to show up to the party <laughs> <laughs> nope no it did not you know we ask this question every single um every single episode of tracking the tropics and um we eventually came, we, we talked with Dr. Philip Klotz back this year, and he kind of gave some insight onto maybe what was going on and why we were so, seeing so many storms form. And he um, brought up the fact that the differences in the water temperatures in the Pacific and the Atlantic weren't necessarily what they are during a regular El Nino. Because we were so warm. We were so warm. And the differences in those water temperatures in the Atlantic and the Pacific are what bring those weather changes. Uh, so we didn't see a lot of activity um, in terms of the El Nino wind shear happening during the summer months. But now that the Atlantic waters have calmed down, have cooled down, uh, we're starting to see that El Nino pattern take effect with um, storm systems coming through at this point. Yeah, which is going to keep us busy this winter. Very, very busy across the south and the southeast, which, you know, yes, we could see some stronger uh, storms come through, severe storms, severe weather possible with these storm systems, but we need the rain. It was a very dry year. Um, also a weird year. <laughs> also a weird year with our summer su summertime thunderstorms. Uh, but, you know, we kind of already talked about this, but the last point of the notable fact was that most of the storms this year were fish storms. Um, and again, that's just a storm that, that doesn't impact land at all. The fish are impacted by those storms and maybe some ships out there have to change some shipping routes. Uh, but other th otherwise, most of there were more more fish storms than there were impactful storms. It's our favorite kind of storm. Don't have to worry about it. Takes a name. Move it on. Yes, yes. Uh, but what we've been talking about is that that El Nino pattern setting up now, heading into the winter, and what that looks like on average. Right? We have we have different days. Um, you know, but when when we'll look back and we average it out, this is kind of the pattern that we uh, that we tend to see with an El Nino. And we have a strong El Nino now in place as well. But the storm track, so those winter storms, the um, the areas of low pressure, um, those tend to be a little bit farther to the south. And what that leads to in the south is uh, more clouds and more rain that lead to generally cooler temperatures, not necessarily cold temperatures, uh, but cooler temperatures because of the clouds. And then obviously wetter with the more frequent storm systems coming through. So this is what we're going to be watching as we head into the winter months. Uh, going to going to stay a little bit more active for us than we otherwise would here in the southeast. But in terms of the tropics, these are not tropical systems. No, but fingers crossed for El Nino sticking around next year. Please, please, please. please, please. Yes, heading into um, heading into the hurricane season next year, that would be wonderful. And we need those water temperatures to stay a little bit.
bit lower, not record water temperatures heading into hurricane season, then we would likely see a little bit less of an active season. That would be my vote if I get one. <laughs> yes. Any last thoughts, Rebecca, on the 2023 hurricane season as we wrap it up? I just think this is going, and, and we've talked about this a couple of times during the season, I think we may start to study average hurricane seasons a little differently based on whether we're in an El Nino or La Nina. I think that we could do ourselves a better service if we had the time to break down this is what we normally see in terms of development zones during an El Nino year, and this is where we typically see development zones in this month during a La Nina year, and that may give us a better idea of what to expect. I think this year gives us kind of a wake-up call and a chance to say this is how we can make the forecast better. Yes, we are. Uh, I think a lot of things are generally going to change heading into the next several years, and obviously we're going to be studying previous years as well, uh, but... For the 2023 hurricane season, I think that does it for our regularly scheduled uh, Tracking the Tropics episode. We want to thank everyone for joining us, whether you've joined us live and asked us questions uh, through our social media sites. Of course, this is an interactive program. Uh, this is going on the fifth season of Tracking the Tropics. We try and make it better every single year for you guys so that we can give you the latest and the greatest information on every tropical system that does develop. We are not here to hype any storm systems but we are here to talk about the tropics. We like to get nerdy with you guys and answer questions about weather and the hurricane season in general. So it's been a strange season for us, but all in all, of course, those warm water temperatures did win out. We are ending, ending up at least the official season above average. Um, we could see another storm or two develop, but they would likely be insignificant storms. So at the moment, we have had 20 tropical storms, seven hurricanes, and three major hurricanes in the 2023 year so far through the month of November, which was right on target with those forecasts from both NOAA and Colorado State University. So an above average year. Uh, and of course, we will be looking ahead to next year and we will be back with some of those forecasts that end up coming out in May, uh, April and into May. But until then, I think we're going to sign off for the 2023 hurricane season. Thank you for all of our featured meteorologists who have joined us this year. And again, thank you to all of our viewers who have joined us, whether live or watched past episodes. You can always watch every episode of Tracking the Tropics that we have recorded on trackingthetropics.tv, even after our live episodes end. They will live on that website there, trackingthetropics.tv. So, Rebecca? I think, uh, I think that's going to do it for us. Thanks for joining us on every single episode. Uh, we will see you guys in the 2024 hurricane season. Find Tracking the Tropics on these platforms. And for storm updates, the latest models, and helpful resources, visit trackingthetropics.tv.